and let's kick it off. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Nicole and Kyla, for sending in the, the Persona review. Um, looks very good, very on point, and we're very stoked to hear more about your thought process and what you guys uh, have been cooking behind the scenes, and if there are any things that we could help you resolve or uh, supply with some additional data points. Um, I'll let you guys um, start this conversation. Sure, thank you for having us. Um, I wasn't um, too sure how Nicole, if you wanted to, how you wanted to structure this, um, but I think maybe the smartest thing is Nicole was the one that focused more on the persona, so maybe for that, um, she could talk more about her work. And then I had questions because I looked at like the existing proof of concept and made annotations on it um, and had more specific questions about the process for making a query and understanding like what variables are the most important for a researcher. So um, yeah, maybe Nicole, if you want to start. Yeah, sure. I can uh, briefly go over the persona, but um, let me show my screen real quick. <laughs> Yeah, so based on all the research that was collected so far on the, this particularly based on all the um, demos and interviews that we had with epidemiologists so far, um, and all the notes that we've taken, like um, the ones that like Joanne and I um, came up with, and also I think uh, I think it was Natani came up with some notes on like, oh, one particular demo with um, Andre. I'm not entirely sure about that, but uh, there was like one Google blog that had like really insightful notes on that, so that was great. Um, and I use that as reference to, especially like particularly for this user persona, it's um, basically serves as some sort of guide to like kind of get an idea of like uh, behind like the uh, like frustrations and goals behind our target user, which I imagine is like epidemiology people or people who are involved in this sort of um, research process uh, specifically surrounding like epidemiology. And so forgive me if there's like certain information here that's like maybe if it's too surface level or it's like not accurate <laughs> um just because of like the, my uh, limited knowledge of uh this sort of like area but so. okay so this is liz lillian she is a 42 year old um overwhelmed epidemiologist she is um I have an epidemiologist at the COVID 19 core at the cdc foundation these are um, resourceful detail oriented and uh, person who's overloaded with the amount of constant new research about COVID-19. Um, then we have like a brief like narrative like uh, her background and like what she does on a daily basis at the COVID-19 um, core uh, team and so she's responsible for get, conducting data analysis and activities related to epidemiologic um, investigation, investigations, surveillance, and research studies pertaining to COVID-19. Um, her typical day, uh, daily activities include like collecting data and conduct analysis for epidemiological and population health investigations in the midst of the current pandemic. Um, she also works with her team members to collect and interpret data analysis results to prepare um, presentations, reports, and uh, papers for a variety of audiences as part of the public health um, emerging, uh, sorry, emergency response. Um, and then usually for persona, user personas, we also have like a um, so sort of like a list of like their, this, their users' um, knowledge and qualities, like their skill sets. Uh, I imagine like these are the typical, these are very, uh, these are all common like um, tools and also like uh, areas of knowledge that epidemiologists like um, deal with on a daily basis such as Excel or PubMed. Um, this particular user is, she knows like how to use these uh, tools very well, but it also takes her some time to get used to them. Um, but just one thing, something that I figured maybe we want to take into account, like maybe like whatever this uh, literature review, review tool will be, it needs to be um, easily, like user friendly, but also like um, uh, easily learnable in some way, um, just for like the sake of time, because like, as you said before, like um, building queries and aggregating information is a complex and time consuming process. That's like one of the frustrations of um, that's outlined in our in this user persona. It's also difficult to determine if a given, given keyword that appears in the paper fits the purpose of the um, investigation or the user's intended um, area of research. And there is a lack of tools to help expand empirical knowledge on which papers to read or not. Um, 
Liz's goal is to access the central hub of complex theories built up by other researchers. This, this might be a thing where it might help speed up the process of building these queries so that the user themselves don't have to uh, worry, like spend so much time on that. Um, have a variety of ways to narrow down research without being overwhelming and reduce the time and complexity ensued when building queries and extracting data from papers. And this is just a basic um, workflow of that like we've seen um, based on our demos with people like Andre and it's a very basic workflow and it could probably like be uh, um, put into more detail but there wasn't enough space for that <laughs> on here but um, that's basically what um, the user persona is about just basically outlining the basic um, frustration goals and of the um, our target user and also like uh, getting idea of like what the workflow is so we can take that into account as we're um, building this new platform. Um, does anyone have any questions or suggestions? Um, where did you make research regarding like the knowledge and qualities that you've listed? Because I can see where you're coming from, but I'm just wondering where you oh, sorry, devised. You I'm just wondering how you've decided how much, like, like you've scaled things. I'm just wondering what made you define them that way, and what was the the, the rationale behind it. Oh, scale things in terms of like the the information that's outlined here. No, the knowledge and the qualities bit. The 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 the, the you know, four marks, two marks, three marks. This sort of yeah, the, the level middle. of uh, experience, I guess. Yeah, the knowledge and qualities section. Oh, right, I'm just right. making. Like where I, obviously we're only at, like personas are all about making like informed assumptions. I'm just wondering where the informed assumptions are coming from. I mean, like PubMed, I get, but some of the other options, I'm not really sure. Yeah, why I think those are or, just assumptions, right? I know they're assumptions because a persona is always an, an assumption. It's literally the definition of an assumption. Um, but it's just inf ideally informed assumption. And I know we've got quite a lot of data and we've had a lot of calls, but I'm just wondering where. What made what, you decide what to wear him the way you did? Oh, yes. Um, wait, are the reasons in for me or can I read? What okay. is S? S A S. Yeah, this was a common tool. So, of, um, wait, to answer like Tyler's question, yeah, it is. This was definitely based on a, an um, assumptions because I imagine like things like SL and uh, SAS or SAS and PubMed are like really commonly used. But like I said, like my knowledge of how well um epidemiologists like are supposed to like know these tools it's like i very I have like uh limited knowledge on um so i tr in a way i try to like balance out like maybe they're like really like uh they have like a lot of like um like excel seems like a common tool that a lot of them use but for me i imagine like this is probably like a you know she would this person would probably like know how to use this tool really well and then maybe like later on she learned how to use this but it's not not her experience with this is not as as much as this but that is definitely something that still needs to it's kind of it's kind of you treating it like like this is the most this is the least and these are like where i'm assuming the weighted order of them would go okay right, i, yeah. I, I kind of got that i just wondered where where your thoughts were behind some of it really more than anything yeah because the rest really, of it is really good so i'm just i'm critiquing for the sake of it more than anything yeah just to like get a better idea yeah, it's just, it is still, this uh, particular area is still something I want to explore, like, more, because it is, it's still very, like, especially, like, this kind of um, way of representing it, it's, you know, especially coming from some, as someone who's not really, like, uh, knowledgeable about the, these things, um, it's kind of hard to, it was a little bit hard to determine, like, you know, these, like, numbers, yeah, like, three I, out of five, I would or two have, out of five. I would have assumed scaling is obviously a way of just giving some sort of visual way to it mm -hmm. but i would have and i understand like why you'd mentioned things like pubmed and embase because they're tools but things like word and powerpoint i would have maybe talked a little bit more about like uh personality traits that epidemiologists are likely to have so like they're probably quite data driven and analytical they're probably like computers like computer savvy but only to a certain extent not to the level of like a programmer or something who's extremely computer savvy. Yeah, I just it was it was just a curiosity more than I want to try and understand your thinking. Right, yeah, no, but it's good, good stuff you've done. Yeah, so yeah, yeah well, that's, that's a good great. point though. Uh, I think Arthur, you're also mentioning something I forgot earlier. Sorry. I have a quick 
question if it's okay. Uh -huh. um, can I see your the the right side, the research? I think it's a research public mm -hmm. So I'm kind of feeling like maybe the section with the qualities um, and this workflow, I wonder if there's a way to like draw inferences if we get a greater idea of what a researcher's workflow is to understand the different tools that they're required to use. Um, and maybe there is a way to make it so that there, less, there are less assumptions in the quality section. Um, because I, I know that personas are, you know, largely assumptions, but I feel like there's a lot of um, a lot of ways that we can take that one section, what you did, and probably find like stats or data from different interviews that were already conducted to support it. Just because I feel like, especially for competitive analysis, it's not like there's no reason to have a good understanding of the different softwares and the different things that they're using. Um, and it'll give us a better understanding of what should what we should be more critical of and what features are important and have to be prioritized. So I feel like it's mm -hmm. not a throwaway section, but there's a way to just uh, even if some of the qualities have to be changed um, or like the amount of skill or something has to be altered, like whether they're actually really good at something that maybe you thought they weren't prior. Um, I feel like there's a way to make the most of it. Um, I think we just have to figure out how, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, and then speaking of um, competitive analysis, uh, maybe it's not, well, actually, maybe this should have been a question for later, but I was also curious, I, I, I guess it's specifically for Arthur. Um, I remember like a few weeks ago, we were, or like maybe a month ago, we were thinking of, uh, at least like when I joined, I think we mentioned that the Lion Literature Review Tool was something that uh, the team wanted to use as, as some sort of reference for um, the our literature review tool, which is, I think I actually had it here. Oh yeah, it's already here. Yeah. So I uh, I was just also curious if we were think, still thinking of using this as, as some sort of reference. Um, well, and the thing is that these tools exist, but they are kind of like um, useful for us to uh, to some extent uh, in terms of mimic mimicking interactions, right? Because for this one, uh, it's very good uh, way to visualize how you would type in something. It would autofill from existing medical dictionaries. Like if you start typing in angiotensin, you're going to see chemical, gene, and other vocabularies in there. And yeah, if you uh, start typing in hydroxy, um, yeah, see, it it finds the relevant terms across different dictionaries, and uh, that way, um, yeah. So right now it's just showing you one, but if you uh, like delete and leave just hydro, hydro, I think you're gonna see. Wait, oh well, that's interesting. Well, usually if you type in some term, it'll it'll gonna show you the, the list of most relevant terms from these different dictionaries that are about, like whether it's a chemical disease, mutation, gene, or it comes from some uh, cancer vocabulary. And this is a useful interaction for us to mimic as the start, as the beginning of the user experience, because all researchers um, are coming to whatever platform we create was an assumption that they will start typing in some terms. And these terms will help them navigate the, um, the landscape of scientific literature. So this tool is very good for this interaction. The other interaction is the graph of um, uh, relevancy. If you type um, or pick one of these, you're going to see the graph um, of co-occurrence. So they actually map out um, co-occurrent terms uh, within the literature. In our scenario, we want to create something similar. And we were actually thinking of not doing a graph to start with and just doing a list of things. So if you go on the right, there is this list view. Um, if you scroll to the right or maybe close this, this view and there should be... Is there a way to uh, uh, are you referring to this uh, portion of the page or? I think if you click X and just close it. Yeah, on the on the left, see there is a little icon uh, that turns, yeah, text visualization. 
So here they pretty much showcase this list of co-occurrence as a list of tags, see, under oxygen. So I was thinking maybe we could actually uh, start from just a list of relevant tags and showcasing how close they are to the terms that you type, typed in versus going straight into the graph as the more complex interaction. So this is also a good um, scenario in here. And also one of the other UI pieces that we could get inspiration from is when you click on oxygen in here, you're gonna see how it's highlighted. Um, now, if, if you click on the like co-occurrences, I think. Um, yeah, click there. Mm -hmm. it's gonna showcase the list of uh, highlights from specific papers, which is something that uh, we would be interested uh, to for, for the showcase where exactly this terms it, these terms appear, whether an abstract or a body of the article, conclusion and other parts. Um, so this tool is very good for the basic inspiration, inspiration of, I would say UI competence, not so much the user experience because uh, in terms of user experience, I don't really think that anyone is using this tool because there is no um, like specific purpose for this tool. It's just an exploration of different terms, how they co-occur and, but I, I may be wrong too. I'm, I'm just not a user of, of this platform. I'll just be clear, these are, are these like the abstracts are taken from these papers? Yeah. Or these are, um, I would say, I believe abstract because I would doubt that they have the full text. Mm -hmm. If yeah, you look at the, the one that Lion oh. says, and you've already opened that, so look at the top line of whatever you've just opened it from and no, it's not. It basically is where the line is in the uh, article. Because photo oxidized stress and whatever, it, it's not the same as the. Yeah, mm -hmm. must be full text then. Yeah, it might have access to the full text, or it might be other parts of it that is publicly or that's available. Or open access article. Yeah, yeah, it might be an open access document. All right. So, um, I just had a thought and I just lost it. But um, I think when Kayla mentioned something about like us, we we're doing like confident analysis. I was going to say that there'll be a great opportunity to get at least familiarize ourselves with uh, things like PubMed and also um, the line like tools like, in reference to like this as like a sort of a um, UI guide. But I imagine like PubMed is like, at least from what I've seen, it seems like the most commonly used tool uh, for like a lot of researchers. So, yeah. and um, Kayla mentioned something to me like before, like, you know, we would want, we would want to follow like common like user patterns that uh, of tools that are commonly used like now, like PubMed. So it would be great to like kind of like refer to this in terms of the user experience and possibly this as like in terms of the UI, but I'm not sure. Um, I don't know, Kayla, what are you, your thoughts right now on this? I don't know what the um, thoughts are. I still know, don't know if we define, decided if we're going to try and make a full site or if we're going to make something that works on top as an overlay to another mm -hmm. site, like a browser add-on or something. I'm not sure where the end result is intended to be. Yet. Yeah, so we're definitely in, in, thinking in, of creating an actual site and then we can basically create an extension that works in the same way and we can plug it into PubMeds and, and other places. But the easiest way for us is to go the route of creating kind of the um, not a better version of PubMed, but just the one that is um, highly specialized to these use cases that epidemiologists are, are looking at in terms of COVID research. Um, so yeah, with that said. Um, I think I'll chime in for a second. Uh, I think it's important if we can try to 
I think in the, in the upcoming weeks, because actually let me look at the schedule really quick, for the competitive analysis for user flows and for lo-fi wireframes, it's going to be very important for both Nicole and I to have a really good sense of whether it's going to be a plugin that ends up being like an overlay and an integration with an existing database, um, or if it's just going to be like a database all on its own that has the um, definitely standalone. Let's uh, push the idea of the the plugin for some later time, just because even though that sounds like an easier uh, solution, it will not. Just because um, we'll have to build essentially the same backend, the same solution, and then figure out how to integrate it in uh, into any existing platform. Okay, cool. So. Um, I'll make a note of that and then we'll keep that in mind uh, for the upcoming things that we have to do. I mean, we're going to get a better proof of concept if we just build something that works on its own. The proof of concept is going to work better, even if we like say if later on, we work out how to integrate into the, the whole ecosystem to make it more accessible because obviously a tiny little website that no, very few people know about is uh, not going to build, not going to pull a lot of traffic. But it's a place to test it. But we can bring people in and then test it, and yeah. use it as a test as a test bed for making sure as assumptions work. And epidemiologists are going to get what they want out of it, because then we can use that to better inform. However, we're going to make it as accessible as possible. Exactly. So, uh, Kyla, in terms of the uh, the next steps, and I know that you listed out competitive analysis as as the next step. Um, have you guys looked at the tools? Uh, not sure if, if we ever gave you access to the Dr. Evidence tool. Um, have you had a chance to check this one out? Mm, no. Okay, I'll, I'll make sure to send you credentials. Um, this is basically a tool that is used for primarily pharma um, use cases, but it has a lot of kind of relevant uh, user interface pieces. Um, again, not sure if anyone uh, within the epidemiology space uses it because it's an actual commercial product, but there might be some inspiration in terms of the uh, competitive analysis. Then, well, it's worth looking at to see how they're delivering things. Yeah, then there is this uh, iris.ai um, company, which is a little bit weird in terms of how it um, oh yeah it's very weird <laughs> it's a strange one is that um kyla and nicole have you had a chance to look at this one oh no i haven't looked so yet. even though i don't really think we we can take a lot of inspiration from this but it's worth just checking out how they position this what's the the list of key features because the the user interface is quite confusing. Um, I When I logged in, and let me try and see. Yeah, it's, it's like they try to map out clusters of things uh, within the article. And it looks like a giant like hexagram or, or something, um, which I'm not sure is, is really useful. But this is just another um, tool that has been pitched as the AI literature review tool. Um, there have been a couple of uh, press article about them and you can sign up, it's a free tool and just explore um, how it looks like. Um, as you can see, this is some, definitely a novel interface, but I'm not sure it's really usable interface. So let's, let's not get too uh, inspired by this one. But I would say these are kind of on the innovation scale are the most um, innovative uh, solutions besides the standard, the industry standard PubMeds, Embases, uh, Mendeleys and, and others. Yeah, that one's, that one's definitely more of a designed design for design sake rather than a functional reasoning. It's like the reasoning, I can't imagine the reasoning behind it to look like that is anything short of it looks cool. <laughs> That's about the only argument you can make for it. Mm, I think um, I took a second to look at this doctorevidence.com um, 
website. And I think it might take me a minute to better understand some of the functionality of the cards, just because I'm seeing a little, some similarities with this and the proof of concept that's on the Corona Y website. Um, actually with that, if it's okay, I'm gonna go into some of the work that I did. Um, and maybe you guys can answer questions for me because I had a little bit of, um, I had some confusions. Um, give me one moment. Okay. Um, okay. So I did some preliminary research. I won't go through too much of it because it's probably all information you're very familiar with. Um, but I guess if I could emphasize anything, it would just be the highlighted information. So my understanding of trying to get really clear on the problem space, my first step is always like doing independent work and trying to be um, as aware of possible as like of what I'm solving for. So, so far I was able to glean from some of the interviews that epidemiologists are trying to acquire a more granular way of making queries and then simplifying a systematic literature review process. And I think Chloe made reference to Cochrane review. So that's something that I'll look at. She was also saying that there are specific criteria that make, um, make an efficient process. So that's something there. Um, and then here, what else here is important? Yeah, the, the Cochrane review, review was more for systemic reviews. A literature review is the step before a full systemic review. So the criteria is like it, to be a systemic review, it has to hit all the things that they talk about through that process. Mm -hmm. So what I got from the conversation that you guys had with her was that the Cochrane review, it's more comprehensive and lengthy and that maybe there's more, I'm not sure if the, maybe you can clarify for me, if the goal is to simplify the process, um, regardless of if you're conducting a Cochrane review and it has to be comprehensive and you have to hit all these benchmarks, that when you're using what the Corona Y platform is trying to do, what you, when you're using this literature review tool, that you'll be able to do that in a less time consuming way. Is that in like the... So it's, it's a complex question. The, I would say the top priority is uh, assuming that there is 100,000 uh, 100, uh, papers on coronavirus, we need to make sure that we provide the, the tools to get researchers to the most relevant papers for them to assess the, you know, the viability of their research in general, and then figure out if these pr papers are worth their uh, kind of like deep uh, analysis and deep um, uh, read through and figuring out if if this paper is relevant to their direction of research on one-to-one -one basis. So this is what um, Andre was accomplishing, was building that complex query uh, so that he can find the hundred that is the most relevant to his question. And then going one by one, he was just like clicking through it, exploring, uh, reading through title and abstract and figuring out if this is indeed relevant. So as much as we can do in terms of moving researchers closer to the point of, uh-huh, this is exactly the paper that I need, and utilizing AI and natural language processing to also extract things from these papers so that we can highlight that this paper is a clinical trial or this paper is the um, um, retrospective cohort study uh, that mentions elderly population or you know any other things that we extract as additional um, um, kind of values out of the paper. This would be the top priority purpose of the tool, or I would say the, the minimum viable product of the tool, because obviously we can imagine it growing into a much more complex solution, but I would say this is the top priority. Okay. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Thank you for hashing that out for me. Um, so from here, I think some of my questions were around understanding like what, so with everything that you just said, like having a really clear understanding of what makes a successful literature review. So if somebody finds what they're looking for, how they're able to do that so that it's not just like parsing through hundreds of things that don't that might have, I think Chloe was saying something like, they might be on this, the specific subject matter, but maybe they're in a location where it happened at a time where, um, like after that study, um, we might have understood that that medication actually wasn't effective as a treatment. 
Um, and also being able to discern like, um, what was it? I think she said, someone said like claims and assertions, um, yeah. like better understanding what claims and assertions are actually relevant um, and having that discernment like what the this end goal is, is. like what I mean by extracting things, right? Those could be claims or assertions. Those could be just sample size numbers or the data points. Like it's about pulling out all the kind of useful data and yeah. pulling some inference out of it. So, to, so the epidemiologist can get from hands enough information as quickly as possible to go, well, that's not relevant because of X reason. I can ignore it rather than having to read through an entire abstract and then go, well, that might be, I'll put that in my may, maybe pile. And then, then, then they'll go through their maybe pile. And there might be sometimes so many more articles that they'll, they'll might pull out 30 maybes, but they might just stop looking because there's too many things because they can't like easily simplify it down to like the really concise thing that they're searching for. And the idea, the idea is we're trying to improve how concisely they can search and how quickly we can extract information. So we can see as much relevant information as quickly as possible, eyes faster. So when they can, they can start doing their systemic review, they know they're not going to miss stuff. They're not going to miss previous. I learned so their time reading. Read, yeah. yeah, they're not going to spend a big chunk of their time reading things that are not relevant because they go, oh, well, not is not relevant because x reason but i only realize after 20 minutes of reading it like the idea is to concentrate their effort where it's most useful on articles that are relevant and to get to that point as quickly as possible mm -hmm. okay cool so i think we're on the same page then at least um so the i think i'm sharing my full screen are you able to see my full screen okay cool so if i'm you're on you see that i'm on xd i hope okay so I went in and I, I know that um, it changes like depending on what the search will be. Um, these things will, the different cards will change and you can expand um, the different cards. So this is just, this was like kind of a preliminary investigation of the different cards and maybe you can let me know because I had some questions. Um, so I numbered everything and then I'll just go through what some of my notes were. So for the, <laughs> So I don't know if this is big enough, but I'll just read through it. So the first thing for the, this card over here, for these two, for like age and gender, I was wondering um, if it would be like most helpful if there was a way for epidemiologists to be able to select the variables that they were most interested in to begin with. So that um, let's say they're more interested in location and um, age, if they are able to select those filters, if you will, from the beginning, then those cards would show up and it might um, make it easier to find things. So that might be more engaging than if they, um, if the goal is to bring them the most relevant information to what they're looking for specifically, I feel like there, there's a contrast between that and what a lot of search, search engines do right now or databases do right now, which is like overwhelm the user with a host of filters and then they might filter so much that they actually end up losing what it is that they're looking for because of the specificity. Um, so I'm wondering if there would be a way for it to be more engaging but really implore them to find the thing that they're looking for um, and also by selecting those specific variables they would encounter material that they didn't know existed prior and it would broaden the search. So I saw this chart in one of the calls and I think the first time I was looking at this project, I encountered this with you, um, that maybe by allowing them to uh, set their own variables for those cards, they would be able to um, think in this way. Like if they're looking at one subject matter, that other things would be able to come up with them. So not that I'm saying that this map view um, would be on this page, uh, I think that that's a secondary idea that maybe we can expand on more in a bit, but that if the goal is for people to be thinking or at least um, getting them to explore and think in this thought process, that allowing them to custom the way that they customize the way that they search for things would be like the first step of that process. Yeah, so um, I think it's, it's actually important to separate the 
kind of the metadata of the paper, which is the location, the author, the origin, and all of the things that are in like a generalized metadata uh, related to the, the publication. And then uh, we have this subset of, of terms that we can extract that pertain to the actual medical space, which is like ACE inhibitors, heart failure, and all of these medical terms that exist in, in different medical um, dictionaries or vocabularies. And this is exactly what we would um, help researchers populate when they start type in like heart, we would uh, showcase the auto population of heart failure, heart uh, disease, you know, all of these other terms. Car and then you'd also have like cardio and a few related words as well in there. So yeah. Yeah. Which is and like the ontology thing. The idea behind this graph was really to take the medical terms and expand them uh, broader for them to spot things that they ha may have missed that also coexist in this uh, space of related things. Because even heart disease um, has like a million, uh, not a million, but like probably like 50 terms that are very close to it. And some researchers publish things and mention heart disease. Some mention uh, cardiovascular disease. And by a combination of these ver various variations of the heart disease, uh, space, we can get them to the the most um, relevant group of papers that talk about this. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense to me. So I feel like there's a, what I got from what you said is that there's a, di there's a distinction between the way that things are populated. So um, you want to be able to give a researcher the ability to like explore medical terminology. Um, mm -hmm. And then the second thing that I got was that um, metadata should be separate from that so yeah and i think yeah. the collections um which is which was a part of this chart um uh, not sure if you have the full chart um uh, somewhere here i can open that full chart in a second but the idea here was that we can um essentially help them let me take over the screen real quick we can um, help researchers type in um, some keywords that are populated from the medical vocabularies. Then we showcase them a, a list or a graph or a map of things that are correlated, um, like the angiotensin receptors are correlated with ACE inhibitors, ARB blockers, and other things. And then um, when they're done with broadening their me uh, medical um, space of keywords, we give them access to a way to filter by metadata, which is where it comes from in terms of journal, journals, uh, yeah, countries it's from, sample size, study types, that sort of thing. Sort of thing. And then they, they basically build out these collections that are primarily built on metadata about the papers. And after that, they're able to explore, explore specific data points for each article. So these are the things that we extract specifically from each paper. So if it's a clinical trial, it definitely has sample size, age, uh, study design, sex, and other things. If it's um, a paper that is not a clinical trial, it most probably has a completely different set of uh, keys and values for for this. Well, like, we've, like we've talked about, if it's, if it's something where it's in, uh, a, a, a trial in an animal just to test if something works. They can talk about what animal it was, if it was a male male mouse, a yeah. female mouse, how big the sample is. So it, it, what type of results would be based on what kind of results exist? So, But um, previously what you were talking about, like how you could maybe um, m customize the interface depending on what people wanted. We have talked about the idea of having uh, profile types which would display more or less things depending on how people are going to be approaching it, but we're not sure how to like differentiate between them yet. So if someone's coming at it from like a geneticist and like an epidemiologist geneticist or something who talk, thinks about how genes are affected by diseases, they're going to be coming from one place compared to like someone who works in public health who really cares about like where things are and sample sizes and very little about genetics. We have talked like that we know that there's different 
groups within epidemiology, but we still don't really understand the space well enough to define what one profile would want versus another profile. So we've not really decided how to break that big glut of information down, but it is something with, it's something we need to do need to do. But at the same time, we don't want to overwhelm them with like, here's pick 10 options before you even start because the, the more resist, the more difficultly, the more steps you put in front of someone before they even get to results, the, the least, the less likely they are they're going to be even in, in, invested in doing it at all. So yeah, uh, the think, idea is to save time. I think that you hit the nail on the head with that because another thing that I was going to bring up in a moment was with the greater number of click throughs, the less engagement you have with a user. Yeah. So, so yeah. The, the point that you had brought up about um, like customizing, customizing to different personas. If you, it, like, I think uh, I'll share for, for a second, but another place I mean, where- uh, Yeah, the way I see it is we could have like a basic and advanced and then like a master version. And the basic would give you some things and then the advanced would open up like genetic things or things that are much more customized. And then the master would be like, here's a massive glut of information. It's probably too much for you to deal with. But if, if you want to go searching around in the, the in, in, you can have all the data and all the, the, you know, you can basically have the whole screen and everything, or you can like choose to make, you can, I'd like to be able to pop things out in and out, you know, like the idea of like the map thing, like that'd be cool to have, but if you just clicked it and it was, you know, closed down and, you know, it, so lots of things a bit closed away and you could go, well, I do care about this, you know, the, the sex so that pop out a little bit on the data points because i think it's it's somewhat hard to understand but maybe this example will uh, showcase it better so uh, let's assume that someone is looking for a surface stability of the virus and uh, they somehow build a query and they land on research results that showcase this article so basically uh what what they would do they would read through the abstract and see if if that was interesting to them. Uh, the reality of this article is that it actually has some of the um, specific data points in them, like material, for example, because since this article talks about the stability of the virus on services, there are different services being uh, researched. And in here in results, ideally in some, some tool, they would see that material, uh, there would be a plastic, stainless steel, copper, cardboard. And that way they would have way more information on, on their hands to decide whether this article even relevant to them. Maybe they're actually interested in just copper or, or something. And this example is very specific. Or maybe it's they're board. not interested in any of their materials and actually they're researching its stability on fabrics or something, which yeah. is like, oh, well, not of, this doesn't talk about the thing that I'm interested in. I can skip right past it without having to read it. If you extrapolate this example to any like super specific like gene based things and you would see a thing that says genes mentioned or something and it's like angiotensin 2 and blah 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 uh, that would help you as a, as a researcher to uh, immediately decipher if this article is worth your attention or this is completely different topic of research. Because remember, all of these tools, PubMed, Mendeley, and others, are simple keyword uh, searches unless you go very, very deep into this complex mesh querying machine. So um, our idea is to extract things from articles, bubble them up into the uh, some form of user interface that um, also allows users to quickly scan through these articles and be able to filter them and collect them into these collections based on metadata. Okay, so with that in mind, my understanding from the proof of concept right now, I feel like, and especially with the chart that you showed, like the more complete chart, the, um, I don't know if it's possible for you to bring it up again, that would be helpful. But my understanding was that in that flow, yeah, so the, the medical terminology in direction of research that seems to be like earlier that's earlier on and then later in this flow there's like metadata it seems like uh if i were to think about it like layered i feel like the metadata comes at a later step and on the oh. um, mm -hmm. 
Wait, what did you say? I'm sorry, you cut out. As filters, basically. So this was what we originally thought of um, in terms of more standard, you know, PubMed filters, but mm -hmm. more specific ones. Because here you can see uh, some level of specificity. And for some articles, they have in, uh, gender mentioned. Uh, for some, they have age mentioned when it's, um, you know, somehow input in the, into the system. Mm -hmm. But uh, it doesn't have things like where the research comes from and uh, many other um, uh, things that we can automatically extract. And even in terms of the, the article type, it's uh, defined to somewhat high level classification of these papers. And um, if you go into our proof of concept, you would see that there is a much deeper um, level of um, specifics in terms of what kind of research that is. Um, the study design classifier is able to distinguish very, very specific um, types of, of it's studies. It's much more granular, isn't it? Yeah which is also of value for researchers because they need to know if it's that uh, time series analysis or retrospective cohort analysis or um, experimental uh, study, randomized uh, ecological regression, and all of these things. Okay, so I'm wondering what you think of the, like, okay, so when I take a look at this, the the confusing part for me is I feel like um, as compared to PubMed, for example, I feel like the filters should take up um, less space. And I feel like some of these cards are actually filters. Um, and it's not to say that they're, I feel like they have a dual purpose of like letting you know what, um, what specific information is in the articles that came up for your query, but they also have mm -hmm. the secondary purpose of being like a filtering tool. So it's I feel both like visualization and the actual control. Okay. That to me, I'm wondering if that's a good functionality, like for what what uh, what I'm gleaning from this. And I'm I would say gleaning. it's not ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's no, just I, I agree. Yeah, I agree with the point that it's of, not a of how um, you know, this is a proof of concept that was compiled using Power BI, which is mm -hmm. basically uh, a toolkit of pre-existing components that you put together and it works. You just it's for business intelligence. It's not really designed to work with 250,000 literature review articles. It's just not built to do that sort of thing. No. It's built for analyzing numbers. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just a visualization tool. That's why there is this dual purpose of the control being also a visualization item. And mm -hmm. we did as much as we could with this tool and we need to, to craft a better interface. No, that's totally fine. My question is, I wanna better understand what you are most, um, like if you were to look at the work that you have currently now, your priorities, because what are you most excited by with what you already have and what are the things that you're like, oh, I think that could be done better and I would like to change it. That's really important for me to understand. So I would um, say that these are pretty standard filters. They, mm -hmm. they're, they just, they're must haves. Uh, the study designs are, I would say, also useful filters, but I would see them being more beneficial as tags uh, under... Yeah, um, ticks, like, just boxes, or yeah, tags that go underneath things. Yeah. A little uh, bit like um, Dakar, is it Dakarno's yeah. tags that he's done? Yeah, a little bit like that. Um, mentions of gender, also kind of a, a filter, but would also be uh, very good to see them as tags. The same was mentions of age. Um, the yeah, I, think, I think ideally if you could have both, a little bit like how PubMed's got tick boxes that filters it, but if you had tags underneath them so you could at a glance see that information, like the population size or the sample size and, and like a, a, an arrangement in a certain order so it's always consistent, but yeah, that way you could scan and go, well, that's different population. That's different. That's not from a geographic region that is relevant or whatever details people are working at. Yeah. Because if like, to try and summarize quickly, that's not relevant. That's not relevant. That's not relevant. Oh, that one it might be. I'll get that one. Yeah. And rather than people, having to uh, have to open an article to understand that it's from Italy, you know, and they're not interested in Italy, that's not a, a great um, kind of... Uh, 
user interface. See, uh, I could tell that it was from Italy by the Just last Just because of a shitload of Italian names. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, uh, you know, sometimes it's very hard to, to understand that. And just scanning, especially if it's like an international study that's got like Japanese authors and German authors and American authors, and it actually is based on a population data that's actually just yeah. Europe. And you're like, well, I don't know what that does. So this part mentioned in literature reviews is actually a little bit more uh, confusing to understand because this is uh, whether these papers were mentioned in specific literature reviews done by um, researchers manually. So um, basically, these are what I was showing in here. And um, let me get back to the, the table. Basically, this was an initiative that was run with 100 uh, researchers, um, medical researchers. And they um, had these medical questions, uh, like the, can the virus be transmitted asymptomatically? and they would just go through a list of articles and extract information manually. So extract sample size, age, and all of these things. So our um, interaction here mm -hmm. was just, um, let's take all of these studies that were mentioned um, in, in these uh, questions and just let's map them onto this uh, proof of concept. So this is not really something that I imagine being um, in the final version of the user interface, though it kind of sh shows a glimpse of the functionality of actual questions. Because as, as uh, Chloe mentioned, or I inquired, there's not really a place for centralized uh, buildup of, of questions about COVID. What are the questions people are asking, yeah. yeah. And this might be as, you know, version two that we would build on top of this, um, a kind of search um, search space where we would um, plug another tag that this um, this paper was mentioned in uh, in the literature review for this specific question. And but the way I, I look at that is a little bit like the an extension on the idea of you've described as collections. Yeah. Whereas we'd have collections that people have made from complex queries that are stitched all together, and you can save this query as a thing that can somebody else can open, but exactly. then then questions would be collections either in a collection of like somebody's asked this question and these are all the things that they linked to it that seem to be relevant to this question and that would be kind of another collection but a collection based on a question rather than a collection based on a data type or a specific specific group naming or whatever so the way i look at that is it's kind of it comes from that stage of our flow would be collections and like questions, it'd be collections and questions. There'd be both kinds of collections, but one of them would be based on, this is what people have talked about and this is what they've started to assemble answers to. Or you could even have questions with no, no answers to yet. Like you could literally just add a question. It's like, this is what I'm thinking. And it, we could just collect them. Yeah, and then we can also pre-populate these with machine generated suggestions. And hey, this paper may be relevant to answer this question. Because this tag and this tag and this in the natural language processing, it talks about these things you were asking about. So then, then an expert can look at, look at it and, imp and improve the modeling and the thinking on it. Yeah. As you can see, we're trying to do a really simple thing. <laughs> yeah. um, so I actually, I have a hard stop at five. So I just wanted to pause you for a second. What I'll do is because there's a, there are many notes that I made, but I don't think that there's enough time to get through all of it. I can share the board with you and maybe you can give me feedback. Um, and yeah. this has been a very informative conversation. It'll help me actually and Nicole, I think redefine the schedule and redefine the things that um, I had thought would be helpful. But I think uh, I would like to make some revisions. So. There's that, but I also, I also had two questions. I don't know where my, I tried to share this and now I lost all my notes. Oh, there they are. Um, the first thing was I wanted to recommend that we maybe had like a weekly check-in for this specifically because there are gonna be tons of questions that we have for each other. And I think it mm -hmm. makes the process faster if we're able to Yeah, check I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that. I mean, I, I've not been available as much recently and I wanna definitely be more involved. I want to be more involved in helping with the UX side as well, not just talking, but I'm just kind of, I've been a bit all over for the last month uh, or so. Just this time, uh, every week work? 
for you guys? Yeah, this works for me. Cool. Fine for me. Well, nine nine till ten is fine. I'll just make it recurring. Nicole, does it work move... for you too? Yeah, it works for me as well. Um, let's just before we wrap up, uh, Matan, uh, Adrian, uh, Andrian, or Sid, or Anton, anybody got anything to say before we do wrap up? Uh, no, I, I follow the discussion and uh, I'll be happy to participate in this. So, uh, yeah, I, I think like, you know, let's go over the notes again and let's go over the comments and uh, let's just be discuss next time. Oh, great. Uh, uh, we'll wait for uh, your notes, Kyla. Um, if you can share them in, in Slack, that, that'd be great. And if anyone else has any questions, please speak up. Um, the last thing that I wanted to ask was two, well, two things, I guess. Um, if there were going to be upcoming interviews, and I wanted to suggest that if there was going to be an upcoming interview, that perhaps it were to be in a more, um, I don't know if it's possible, but if it were to be in a controlled environment, maybe with just one or two people, because when I was watching some of the interviews previously, um, I feel like every time a really important piece of information would come up, uh, someone would ask a question and I would get confused. Um, like there would be like different questions coming up and then interruptions and sometimes like for user testing and user interview specifically it's so important because you only have like that time with that person to get those gems you know mm -hmm. so if yeah. it's possible. Um, we're planning to shoot out another round of messages on LinkedIn this week so hopefully we get another interview next week and yeah, and if and when it comes to yeah, I'm I'm completely on board with yeah the the user interviews should be like three or four people top end really, and they should be like people who are actually just asking questions and trying to really drill into the thoughts rather than general discussion because general discussion can be useful but also not very focused. And I completely agree. It's um, we need to try and focus because I'm. I am the worst at distracting it, so I, I'm aware of that. Yeah, Matan, uh, moderator, that, that's a good word. Someone needs right. to moderate me. I, I completely agree. I'll let you know, Kyla, if we will have some interviews uh, upcoming week, and maybe I'll invite you to, um, to those if you'll be able to join. And thanks, everyone. A very good call today. I'm super excited to kick off the uh, more formal UX timeline. And uh, me and Anton actually started working on kind of uh, systemizing um, the, the technology roadmap. And we'll be syncing singing internally with Matan um, and other people to actually figure out what it would take to build all of these uh, things together um, and figure out how, how we can layer the technology on top of the UX time. So good stuff. Thanks, everyone. Okay, cool. Thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of your week. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Okay. See ya. Thanks. Cheers, guys.